This podcast is brought to you by Big World Tours, a company that I'm setting up in partnership with a good friend of mine designed to allow you to travel and dive deep into your passions and interests through our niche tours. Our first trip will be England at the end of April 2016 for nine days, and it's the English Choral Experience. We're focusing on the English choral history, the English choral tradition, visiting and hearing music in such places as King's College, Cambridge, Bath, and Winchester and Salisbury Cathedrals. It's going to be an amazing trip, capped at only 12 people, and if you'd like to learn more, go to www.bigworld.com. Again, www.bigworld, all one word, dot com. Big World, travel your passions. Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco. Today, we're going to talk about one of the major economic developments happening during the reign of Elizabeth I, specifically trade and exploration, as well as some of the notable people and companies that were involved in the Elizabethan Age of Discovery. But before I get started, just a reminder that if you like this podcast, please rate it in whatever service you use to listen to it, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or something else. And also remember that at www.englandcast.com, there are continually updated resources like reading lists, listening lists for music, and buttons to donate and links to the Patreon page if you are so inclined to support this podcast, either by giving a one-time tip or by making a regular subscription contribution. And both are incredibly appreciated. So let's get started. We like to think of the age of exploration as this kind of grand period in which explorers who were driven by these purest ideas of the burgeoning enlightenment, they went off to seek new lands and um, make these great discoveries just for the sake of, of discovery alone. And it wasn't quite that simple. Like many other discoveries that massively changed the world, the age of exploration was driven by economics. So most of us have heard stories about how the returning crusaders, having been introduced to spices and silks and the wonders of the East during their time in the Holy Land, came back to Europe with tales of these amazing products and a taste for things like sugar. And the trade routes to Western Europe were cumbersome. They made these products ridiculously expensive and difficult to obtain. And if new routes could be found, then it would make these products much easier to get and all of Europe could more easily access them. And a lot of them, a lot of the spices especially, were used um, a lot more than we might use them today. Um, It's getting to be fall, so I'm thinking a lot about cinnamon and cloves and fall spices. Um, And, you know, we tend to use things just for taste like that. But uh, during the Middle Ages, um, they were actually used a lot uh, to to, um, actually preserve meats and also to flavor ales because people didn't really um, drink water. So they actually had much more of a of an economic uh, impact than maybe they would today. So, um, you know, that is all true. And there's also a lot more involved, especially in the case of English exploration. Um, While it was economically driven, it was also the product of several historical forces coming together in a perfect storm of ideas and technological advances that combined to make kind of everything possible. So by the mid 16th century, the Italians had a monopoly on trade from the East. That's not really a secret. The merchants of Venice and Genoa had long been the only ones with access to the traders and knowledge of the routes. And by the beginning of the 15th century, so the early 1400s, the Portuguese and the Spanish were attempting to sort of break the monopoly and find their own routes. Um, People like the Portuguese Henry the Navigator were sponsoring voyages of discovery in the early to mid 1400s. And England actually came to the exploration table much later than these countries, than many other countries. And in part, that's because in the 15th century, they were too busy fighting battles over the succession in what would become known as the Wars of the Roses. 
And the early Tudors were kind of a bit too distracted with keeping a hold on power, as well as um, a certain matrimonial issue going on for one of them, um, to really focus on funding exploration in a really big way. So they were familiar with what was going on with Spain. Of course, the stories of ships coming back loaded with gold and bullion, silver from the discoveries in the Americans, in the Americas, it, it would have been very tempting to them. And King Henry VII actually commissioned John Cabot to lead a voyage to find a northern route to the Spice Islands of Asia. And that began the search for the Northwest Passage. So that was Henry VII. And Cabot sailed in 1497, and he did reach Newfoundland. And then he led another voyage to the Americas the following year, um, but nothing was ever heard of him or his ships again. So then things kind of just went into decline for exploration for England. Um, but by the later part of Henry VIII's reign um, was the beginning of the Muscovy Company, um, and, and the kind of events that would put that into place were happening when Sebastian Cabot, he was John's son who had been working for the Spanish his whole life, he arrived back in England, and he began lobbying for an expedition to sail to the north in order to find a new trade route to Asia. They thought that if they went directly due north over Russia, they would be able to kind of come down along the coast and and get to Asia that way. Um, and they finally actually left, um, uh, the expedition left at the end of Edward's reign. Um, and the ships had come back during Mary's reign. <laughs> so three changes in monarchs during the time that it takes to put together and launch one vent venture probably wouldn't make you think that it would be very successful. Um, I actually did an episode solely on the Muscovy Company in, I think it was November 2014. So you can listen to that from the archives to get more information specifically on the Muscovy Company. It's a really interesting story of uh, how England's kind of had this relationship with Russia. Ivan the Terrible actually proposed to Queen Elizabeth. So it's a really interesting story. You should totally check it out if you haven't already. So now let's skip to when Elizabeth took power as Elizabeth I. England was internally torn apart. Um, Elizabeth herself had nearly been implicated in a plot to overthrow her sister Mary a few years before, and England was really yearning for some permanent structure. Although it has to be said that what was going on in England wasn't as bad as, as some countries. In France, of course, especially later on, the relationships between the Protestants and the Catholics would just kind of explode and the, and the Huguenots would have to leave. And, you know, they had a lot of internal strife going on. Also in the Netherlands, there was a lot happening because they were being ruled by Spain at the time. So um, England was was starting to look pretty okay at this time. But one problem that England had was that the, the exports were so dependent um, on the wool trade with the Netherlands. So the economy was just completely dependent on wool trade with the Netherlands. 90% of English exports at the time um, was semi-finished wool. And the number one customer was the Netherlands. The Netherlands were, like I just said, under Spanish control during this time. And so the economics of the wool trade were a huge concern during Elizabeth's reign um, to have all of your eggs in one basket, as the saying goes. Not only did they have all of their eggs in one product, and then that product relied solely on a country with which um, relations were souring. So it, it was, a, it was a, 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 something to worry about during that time period, and they really needed to find some new markets. So the problem by now was that Portugal and Spain, of course, had surpassed the Italians through the discovery of the Americas. And in 1493, the Pope ruled how, how Portugal and Spain would kind of split up the new world, and they just were running way far ahead of everybody. And now they had a monopoly, and they weren't about to go giving it away. And they kept their maps and their charts so completely secret. It was at such a high level. They were treated as any other important kind of security state documents. Um, the maps and the navigational charts that they had were just kept so secret. Um, it was a really big deal to kind of have access to that. Um, and that's why when Sebastian Cabot came back to England, it was a bit of a coup as well for him because he did have some of that knowledge. 
Um, England was a seafaring country, of course. Um, there was still Norse Viking blood running through the fishermen and, and the, uh, skills and the maps had only, though, allowed them to sail within sight of land. Um, of course, the Vikings had sailed across the Atlantic Ocean years and years, centuries before. But for the English, they really only sailed within sight of land. Most fishermen never would have would have sailed past where you could see. Um, and they were going to need to catch up very quickly. There were some new technological advancements of advancements that would help measure location using the angle of the ocean. Um, and there were some new products that they were able to, to get access to some new learning and some new technologies, which was largely through contact that, um, people were having with the Arabic traders. So Europeans were able to learn how to make a compass as well as an astrolabe which would help boats figure out which direction was north and also then with the compass. And then the astrolabe helped you figure out your rough latitude. Longitude wasn't accurately measured yet, but you could estimate your speed in the ship's log and you could make kind of a rough, rough guess. It was very rough. Um, but latitude um, and being able to know exactly where north was, was, was really valuable, of course. So England got some access to, to this technology. They also needed something else. They needed something like these charts, these maps that the Spanish and the Portuguese were using. And they got it in the form of a textbook, which was called Breve Compendio de las Vere. Um, it was a Spanish textbook by Martin Cortez. Someone involved with the Muscovy Company was able to get a hold of this book in some way, um, of course, it was probably a spy, uh, was able to get a hold of a copy of this book, was able to uh, translate it to the art of navigation and published it in English in 1561. And this book, The Art of Navigation, Breve Compendio de las Fere, uh, scholars agree it represents one of the decisive steps that led to the oceanic expansion of England. So by the mid 1560s, England is starting to really look good. She has a stable monarch. She has new technology. She has secret knowledge, but she still needs some kind of burning impetus to take the risks that such voyages would require, both in terms of the money and the potential loss of life. So relations with Spain provided one of the drives. England and Spain were in sort of a cold war. Spain was ruled by a Catholic, Philip II. He didn't recognize Elizabeth as the queen. Um, I did a whole episode on you know the Catholic experience in England. Um, it, it was a, a really rough time for Protestants and Catholics in, in all of Europe. But the Pope had excommunicated England or had excommunicated Queen Elizabeth. Catholics were under no obligation to uh, obey their oaths to her. And you've got Philip really wanting to bring England back into the Catholic fold. It was sort of his um, raison d'etre. It was why he was in, in existence. He wanted to bring England back. It was a really big deal for him. So the idea that for English, for, for the English Protestants, the idea that the New World was going to be settled by Catholics, i.e. the Spanish and the Portuguese, who would teach Catholic Christianity to the native peoples that they would discover, it was really difficult for a lot of English Protestants to, to sort of stomach that idea. One of these people was Richard Hacolyte. He was a minister who was also England's first travel writer. He began collecting every piece of information on travel and discovery that he could find. He went to France with Francis Walsingham to, in part, find out intelligence on what the French and Spanish were doing exploration-wise. He just became obsessed um, with collecting every piece of, of travel reporting that he could find and putting it all together and publishing it. He was commissioned by men like Walter Raleigh to write um, supporting treatises on why England should take the risks involved and make voyages of discovery. He spent his life trying to get voyages funded, and he was essentially a one-man public relations team for American colonization. And another person who was very heavily involved 
was a fellow called John D. John D is an interesting person. He was a mathematician. He was an astronomer. He was an astrologer and a philosopher. And he advised Queen Elizabeth in a lot of her sort of imperial policies. He stood between the two worlds of magic, i.e. astrology, and quote unquote, real science, just as they were starting to become distinguishable. Um, You know, in in medieval England, astrology and astronomy were the same thing. Um, And it was just starting to get to a point with the Enlightenment where scientists would start to make a distinction between fields like astrology and alchemy, Um, chemistry and alchemy, at one point would have been the same thing. Um, But after the Enlightenment, they were separated out. So he was really straddling both sides of it at the time. He was an expert in geometry. He also practiced alchemy and occult philosophy. He had been a consultant with the Muscovy Company. He prepared nautical charts for them. And he instructed the crew on geometry, on cosmography before they left for their voyages to North America in 1576. And I I said cosmography. Cosmography was an interesting science at the time as well. Cosmography was pretty much the science of mapping the universe. And that would include mapping the heavens, all the way down to, to mapping the earth, mapping grains of sand. Cosmographers were fascinated by how the universe worked. They were almost astronomers, but with this kind of focus as well on the earth, on earth sciences. So if you just, from from the ground you're standing on all the way up to all the stars you could see, that would be cosmography. And it was a a science that was really starting to take off during this time as well. So John Dee was a cosmographer. Um, One of the things he did was early on in 1570, he was commissioned to write a report by Robert Dudley and Christopher Hatton uh, called the Britannica Republic Synopsis. It was a summary on the Commonwealth of Britain. And he summarized issues that were facing the country, as well as the possible outcomes of various actions and suggested solutions that he thought would work. And he really wanted to see England take off in a big way. He saw the rise of a British empire he believed there were historical precedents that that England could assert prior claims to the new world. And he believed that England should invest heavily in a navy and should prove maritime supremacy. And that would make his vision a reality. And then England could become wealthier through using the resources found in the Americas and other newly discovered places. And of course, by 1588, with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, England had proven her maritime supremacy, and that would be largely unchallenged all the way for another 400 years, 300 years to the 20th century. So many of the voyages of discovery occurred also in partnership with privateering raids. So in 1562, Elizabeth sent pirates to seize booty from the Spanish and Portuguese ships off the coast of West Africa. When the war with Spain intensified after 1585, Elizabeth approved further raids against Spanish ports in the Americas and also against shipping uh, ships that were returning to Europe with treasure. And of course, Francis Drake is a famous pirate um, who famously raided the port of Cadiz uh, the year before the Spanish Armada was defeated in 1587. He he had this very famous and daring raid on, on Cadiz where he went in and burned all the ships and got a lot of treasure. So some of the other British people involved were Martin Frobisher. He landed at Frobisher's Bay on Baffin Island in August of 1576. He returned again in 1577, claiming it in Elizabeth's name. And he went on a third trip as well. He wanted to found a settlement and he was unable to do that. Something else, Francis Drake, he was a very busy man. He he circumnavigated the globe um, in 1577 to 1580. And he claimed a lot of land for England. Uh, He made it all the way up. His voyage is fascinating. He made it all the way up to um, California, 
Uh, there's a place called Drake's Bay. That's where he supposedly uh, made it. I think it's near Monterey, I want to say. Um, but yeah, so there's Central California. Supposedly, Francis Drake made it all the way up there uh, before crossing the Pacific Ocean. So he he was able to claim a lot of land for Elizabeth. Um, but England actually didn't really do a lot to follow up on his claims. And then there was um, Humphrey Gilbert sailed to Newfoundland, and he took possession of the harbor of St. John's um, together with all of the land within 200 leagues to the north and south of it. And then there was Walter Raleigh. He was, of course, granted a charter for the colonization of Virginia, which was named after the famous Virgin Queen. And we all learned this in elementary school, I'm sure, at least in the U.S. we did. Um, Raleigh and Elizabeth they actually really wanted to have a base from which they could raid the Spanish boats, um, the Spanish treasure ships. There wasn't so much the idea of having a lasting colony, a lasting civilization there, or a lasting um, settlement. It was more just to have this base to raid the Spanish boats. Um, Raleigh sent others, other people to found the Roanoke colony. And again, it's something that we all learn in school, how, how it disappeared after a few years um, was this big mystery that has never been solved. What happened to Roanoke? Suddenly it just disappeared. Um, people were there. And then when the ships came back the next year, they, they weren't. So that was a, a setback. And um, then in 1600, the queen chartered the East India Company. The East India Company was looking the other direction towards India. It established trading posts, which evolved into British India on the coasts of what is now India and Bangladesh. So that's going right up to Elizabeth's death. And after Elizabeth died, this all didn't just stop. England continued the colonization efforts that had begun and explorers like Henry Hudson continued to look for a Northwest Passage, um, founding settlements in New York. Hudson, of course, discovered um, the whole New York area, the Hudson River, and he wound up sadly dying on a in a in the ice in the Hudson Bay when his team, actually his ship, mutinied against him, and they left him in an ice flow. Um, at, before sailing back to England. So that was a bit of a tragedy, but that was Henry Hudson. And uh, so there were other people. And then, of course, as the religious tensions escalated, the separatists and the Puritans started looking towards the New World, not just as necessarily a trading base, but actually a place where they could actually go to settle and build a life and, and build a place away from the religious persecutions that they were experiencing. So it all kind of started from from the textbook that they shouldn't have had access to, but the spy got. It's a really interesting story. I wish there was more written about it. I, I can't really find that much. If you happen to know anything about this textbook, I would love to know more about it. I found a couple of um, you know reports about it, um, but I'd love to know more. So that's it for this week. The book recommendation is called Hackalite's Promise and Elizabethan's Obsession for English America. It's a really cool book on, on Hackalite and also um, just kind of gives a good overview of what all was happening during this time. It's by Peter C. Mancall. And I'll put a link up on the site and on the Facebook page. Again, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash Englandcast. You can, again, go there to contact me, send me show ideas, or just say nice things. And also, please check out my blog. I have a really cool blog that I write neat things about history and music in particular and travel. And so it's at curatory.com. That's K U R A. T-O-R-Y, curatory.com. And I've also started doing regular quick segments on different aspects of Tudor history on YouTube, and it's called The Tudor Minute. So you can go to YouTube and search for The Tudor Minute. And there's also a link on the blog and the Facebook page as well. So that's what's all going on with that. And thank you so much for listening. And I will talk to you soon. Blow northern wind Descend for baby sweating, blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. I caught a board in Bowerbrick, that's all his family is on sea. Men 
Schutzpool meiden auf mich, fern freit von In all this world, flesh of one, burn of blood and of bone, never yet in Ostern, not so many in London.